clear that we have some uh, quite uh, substantial challenges, uh, not just in Europe, uh, but globally, um, in understanding what is the market. Uh, so thanks for the introduction. My name is Martin Poinskow. I actually also, um, apart from having the coordination role on the IoT roadmap um, for Europe, uh, together with, with Rolf and Monique and the colleagues, um, I also represent a lot of uh, municipalities. So you could see the demand side, where actually the cars will be driving, where actually the uh, energy distribution will happen where actually the economy will mean jobs or not. So really, how does this come down on the ground with citizens and taxpayers and uh, let's say the babushka uh, onion ring uh, governance that we have around this in Europe is incredibly important. But just as important is it to understand how do we not break many of the things on which our society and our economies are built on. So when you come to the local level, it is incredibly important, not just that Europe is fine, because if my corner of Europe is not fine, we have a problem. So I think we have some really fundamental challenges here. And of course, technology uh, is a, an essential part. And actually this concept of decentralization, the move to the edge, it's not just a technical concept. It's also a political concept. It's an econom economic concept where the power to, um, to, to do transactions, the power to innovate, the power to grow and scale suddenly also moves to the edges. It becomes possible to not have these centralized structures that we needed in uh, the previous uh, century to uh, orchestrate our lives. So it's really uh, interesting to see now Europe's digital decade, we all know, with the 10,000 uh, climate neutral edge nodes. Let's have a little discussion about that as well, if we can. Um, but also we had uh, yesterday the AI um, legislative train now leaving, you know, hot on the heels of GDPR. And we know that this, uh, this legislation actually um, was a stake in the ground for Europe. Um, but the question is then, um, how can we build policies that also build uh, prosperity uh, as, as along with the um, uh, climate neutrality and uh, the uh, social inclusion? So I'm very happy now to uh, bring uh, the excellent uh, voices of the uh, some key uh, ecosystem players here. So you bear from um, uh, the Gaia X, uh, very very welcome. I give you the floor uh, in a, in a second. You, I, I think an exemplary example of how ecosystems are forming around these new uh, challenges. So let's come back to that. Uh, Dario from Etsy, standards, they are essential, but also, I mean, from my perspective, I'm involved with both Etsy, global standards and so on. Standards probably will not save us tomorrow. There is uh, some implementation details and there's a lot of politics around it. So what's the role of European standardization ecosystems, I think is essential in this also. Um, but uh, good to have you here, uh, Dario, thank you. And uh, Christa from Ericsson, of course, uh, very, very important to see how this also becomes, you know, real um, business as well as real infrastructure in our societies. Because I mean, the, the technologies that, that you represent really touch the ground. That's where the digital becomes grounded uh, when, when we reach the system. So thanks for having you, you here. And Gerardo from NXP. So, um, well, the new material that we have in the new millennium um, is the digital. Uh, and, and that is a very, very concrete material with some characteristics. Um, and of course, there's, there's a market dimension around it. I'm, I'm a Danish native uh, and we are in the Danish Commonwealth together with Greenland. Uh, so of course the whole uh, supply chain of, you know, the actual materials to build the digital uh, society foundation uh, is politically very, very hot uh, also from, from our perspective. So thanks for joining us, us here. So now I would like to offer in, in sequence, uh, first, uh, Hubert, if you would like to, to share some, some vision with us, some thoughts here in uh, these uh, five, five to eight uh, minutes, uh, uh, please uh, take the floor. It's a pleasure to, to have you here. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Martin, uh, for this nice introduction. And also thank you to Piers and to Max, who have mentioned several times 
Gaia X. I would like uh, in five to eight minutes to give you a flavor of what is Gaia X and to uh, tell you why we believe it's an important element of this uh, strategy for edge cloud. The first thing, which is really uh, something that you may know or not know, Europe is very late in adopting cloud. And typically using Eurostat statistic, which have been published a month ago, and if you subtract uh, from the numbers, the uh, email services and the uh, cloud file storage, we see that Europe is only using cloud for 26% of its processing. So why should we go to edge cloud if cloud has not penetrated in Europe? And as you can see, uh, Germany, France, which I will come back in a minute, are only respectively at uh, 20 and 21 percent, meaning that a lot of resistance is still in the cloud domain. So what is GAIAX AISBL? I think uh, um, I can say that uh, Khalil Rwana, at one of the discussions we had, said to me, you should be the voice of the industry. This is exactly what we want to be. The industry with users, the industry with cloud service provider, with technical integrator from all over the world. And so GaiaX was initially uh, created by 22 founding members. Those 22 founding members, they were coming from Germany and France. They were at the beginning 11 uh, cloud service provider and technical company, seven users, two association and two academics. What it is we have done in the first month of our existence, which has to be to create some document about the key elements we believe will be helping us to increase cloud penetration. So what is stopping cloud penetration in Europe is absence of portability, absence of interoperability, and difficulty to guarantee data sovereignty. So the way we want to create the momentum to change that is by establishing policy rules and policy rule will be specific rules that cloud service provider will accept to respect in order to facilitate portability, interoperability and data security. Those policy rules cannot be isolated from each other. They are part of architecture of standards. And the objective of GAIAX is to provide before the end of the year, a federation of services, which will be open source and which will be made available for anyone belonging to GAIAX. What is important is to say that we do not believe we will progress in this uh, challenge if we do not take specifically both the data space facilitation and the uh, cloud uh, service provider infrastructure facilitation together. That is the meaning of the X that you see there. The meaning of the X is that we should take those two challenges together in the same environment. So what we have done since uh, we have been created, which is the uh, 4th of June for the launching and the 15th of September for the official registration, we have managed to gather 234 members. And as you can see, they are distributed all over the world. So we can say that just about every cloud service provider in the world is part of GAIAX, as well as most of the technical companies. But what is important as well is that distribution is really made around both large company users startup. The reason for that is that if we want to go to the next step, we need to make sure that those policy rules are built together by both users and providers. Now, I would like to tell you, and I think the previous session was very interesting in that respect, that as it was mentioned in the European Strategy for Data published uh, last year, it is important that data space facilitation be taken first. And data space facilitation in the way we see it in GAIAX 
is not only to have great ideas for what needs industry, what needs health, what needs agriculture, but to make sure that we regroup together the key players in each of these domains and that these key players are able to express what it is they want to share as data under which circumstances they will accept to share these data. And I'm happy and proud to tell you that this afternoon <coughs> we have a data space webinar from GaiaX where C-level executive will show what are the data they want to share and under which circumstances they will be, re be ready to do it in industry with Catenaix, in health with Philips, in agriculture with FNSEA, mobility, Air France KLM, finance, Caisse des Depots, energy uh, will be EDF and others, and skills as well with the Minister of Education in France. Now, moving <clears throat> to the topic of today, what is key to say is that the edge cloud is primarily uh, intended to uh, help the move of cloud into the real-time applications. And what makes the real-time application special is that you do not do real-time application as a continuity to classical application. What makes real-time application special is that non-functional requirements are taking precedence because security, because response time, because resilience of the application is absolutely of the most important. Manufacturing as a service, digital twin, autonomous driving, networks, defense, cloud gaming are examples of that. Now, what is important is to realize, and this is something we realize very well, because we do have on board all the cloud provider perspective, uh, cloud providers from everywhere in the world. We have most of the telecom operators and we have many of the edge device producer. And we believe that the game will be around these three types of, uh, pro, uh, of uh, companies. We know now that cloud provider are willing to expand cloud to edge cloud by making alliance with telecom operators. So we have seen AWS working close to uh, Vodafone, for instance, in Europe on Verizon in uh, the US, and they will probably as well uh, build their own edge device as we have seen in the recent past. Now, what is important for us is that only those companies which understand what are the real-time requirements of the user have a chance to make it happen. Because it will not be that the edge cloud will be an extension of centralized cloud. You need to understand what are the automotive requirements. You need to understand what are the health requirements. And only if you have that, you have a chance to make it happen. That's why we believe Europe has a real chance if we manage to have the requirements for these applications expressed at the top level of the company as a must for the future. That's why we believe it is important that C-level executives are expressing these needs. Now, if I go one step further and I will finish with that, we fully agree with the direction that Max and uh, Pierce have proposed earlier on. This is an opportunity to Europe to have a continued compute uh, capability. And we believe this question of a meta operating system, which will be working across the board, is of the essence. But for that to happen, we need first to have an absolute certainty that the requirements of the various data space willing to share data have been taken first. And this is why GaiaX will help in building that strategy by getting the very precise description of those requirements in the various domains, by setting up the policy rules to facilitate cloud uh, penetration, but also to make sure that by building reference implementation, we will be able to demonstrate what is really needed by the users 
with industrial companies uh, doing cloud edge cloud and uh, cloud service provider can put them in motion when they have been tested with the users. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this inspiring um, overview of the uh, initiative. Um, so by the end of the year, that's a challenging uh, uh, deadline. Uh, there was a question in the chat. Uh, maybe you can just quickly reflect what is the status on this crucial aspect of interoperability uh, between, um, well, the data spaces, the data parts of, of this whole um, uh, landscape of, of data? Any, any short yeah. answer? So, Martin, a very simple example, which would be illustrated this afternoon. In health sector, which is very important these days because of the pandemics, Philips has been the one driving uh, the uh, re uh, reduction of the position paper to see what they have to do in the next four years. Philips is not notably using AWS. If they want to work with Sanofi, which is using another cloud service provider, interoperability means that if there is not an agreement between AWS and the uh, cloud service provider of Sanofi, no data sharing is possible. In the same way <coughs> that <coughs> If hospitals continue to bury their data in their own data center, there will be no data sharing. So there is a sequence. First, anyone should put their data on the cloud. Then we need to make sure the interoperability policy rules are adopted by the cloud service provider, be them uh, European or American. But it is only because we have on board Google, Amazon, and Microsoft that we have a chance to leverage this change of attitude, which will finally translate into an ex-ante interoperability compliance, which will be supported by specific label that the board of GAIA-X will deliver to the one which are in line with what has been requested. Fantastic. No, and it's it's great to see this, this ambition. Of course, we also know that there is uh, on the side of this the European interoperability framework, which is currently being upgraded uh, also oh, to have oh, this. Uh, oh, for sure. We know very well SWIPO, Martin, and SWIPO will be a useful contribution into it, but we believe we will also be a very important contribution to the EU cloud rule book, which will be <laughs> later on becoming uh, uh, an obligatory uh, statement uh, if you want to operate in Europe. Yeah, no, that, that's good. And, and my, my point is also exactly that, that these things are converging now exactly. very, very quickly. Um, so we have seen now the EIF, there was uh, the, the, the EIF for smart cities and communities, which is specific uh, concept for having, you know, the horizontal and vertical domains uh, aligned, you know, in, in, a, in a proper fashion. From Ericsson, uh, Krista, uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, your perspective now, we, we are moving a little bit from you know the, the, the big ecosystem side, then the bits and pieces, the nuts and bolts, to the ones who are actually then hammering them to the ground. So how does this look uh, from your side? I'm guessing the, the, the questions are the same, but the perspective might be um, uh, complementary to what we just heard. Thanks for joining us. So we see your screen, um, you're still muted. Um, maybe you can full screen uh, the presentation. Yes, do you hear me now? Yes, thank you a lot. And do you see my screen in full? Yes, we do, excellent, thank you. Very good. Thank you for, for inviting me. Um, I will, uh, I'm part of Ericsson's CTO office and drive technology strategies for IT and cloud. And I will uh, speak a little bit around that, but also use my, my uh, uh, part of being part of the AECC uh, Automotive Edge Compute and being part of the uh, board and also founder of that initiative. So I will use a lot of that in this discussion. So for the discussions and the questions that were raised, I think it's important that when, when, when we look at alliances in general, it is so that, that it's not wise or, or desired or even possible to decide, you know, what, what alliances will be that will prevail, what will make a difference and, and who will not. 
and you know, and perhaps there have to be a multitude of these uh, different alliances, and some will fail, some will succeed. And the real value from these comes really from the fact that that the companies in general uh, get together and form alliances as such, and and solving a problem. And new alliances will continue to arise and continues to give the uh, value to the society. And and just an ex as an example, we can look at <laughs> some of the ongoing activities with automotive and connected vehicles. And there is a huge number of activities ongoing. And by the way, most of these that I present here is, is Europe-based. And, and that will and may lead to some fragmentation over time, of course, but and also complexity. But in the end, I think, you know, all these uh, activities that we do and that has been initiated here will lead to broader innovation and, and new ideas and solutions will come in place uh, that bring value to the common solution for communication in general. So, you know, we, we should really be, be, be happy that we have so many industry uh, re relations and alliances coming up. Then I think back to the previous discussions, it is very important, of course, that we ho have horizontal standardization. I mean, to make sure that the, there is a common framework as a base for not only for, for instance, automotive, but for multiple industries. And that is typically covered by the SDO, such as 3 dpp and Etsy. So the, the important thing is, of course, that these new industry lines put new requirements to these SDOs rather than defining their own and, and uh, perhaps more important even to decide upon what we call blueprints or, or on existing standards because standards is quite uh, uh, wide, you know. So that means really agree on a common framework and usage of these standards and, and uh, both for generic and specific use cases. So the, the, the common practices that we want to have should could be collected by a central organization. And that is an interesting thing for Europe to think about you know, to set multi-industry common views and solutions that, that is different from the SDOs because the SDOs is typically working on standardization. But, but the, the common practice, the blueprints is very important. So, and, and the, you know, the connected cars and edge computing for co connected cars is one such example where there are many different ways to, to, to come to a conclusion. And it, it is really important that there is there is a common understanding of the challenges and the proposals for the solution. So, you know, as, as many features provided by multi-actors uh, solutions, not the least for the global multi-country, it is important that these alliances put requirements on providers of connectivity in cloud and these, that this becomes available and adap adapted. I mean, this has to be open. So it's a, as a base, it is, important also that alliances have a, what we call a real problem domain and it should preferably be a business related one it should be a business problem to solve and and typically there are certain use cases to solve to be successful and also to have a continuous drive you know otherwise if you if you look at it if you don't have that there is a risk that we sort of try to standardize something that is not really needed and it's also common risk that these alliances don't just continue, even if the original problem is solved and you, you don't really know what your new problem is. So uh, looking a bit at the, the uh, just an, ex as an example, what we look at from Ericsson's side, just the pro problem domain is often defined by the industry company, providing the service, owning the end user business. It's important that they are in the driving seat, but there may be very different dis disparate requirements then within an industry. And just looking at this, what we see from Ericsson's side on the connectivity requirements for different segments within automotive is a good example. And these are what we typically call connected vehicles, but all of them have different requirements. And that is very important to understand. So. Looking at this then, so I mean, if we look at innovation in general, I mean, ecosystems and evolution is global. Alliances and standards in general must be global and open. And, and I mean, Europe can create its own, of course, but uh, because that will very soon become stale and irrelevant. So the important thing is that, that Europe as such have to be part of the global, uh, you know, the global ecosystem and the global uh, movement, so to say. And, one example, as I as I work for ACC, I just want to mention that 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 one example that where we have a clear problem domain and also clear uses 
cases to solve is this uh, case where, I mean, the, the problem comes from Japanese automotive OEM with a global market, and there are global industry players from different regions and different industries that come together to solve a problem. And, and the, you know, creating guidelines and recommendations to, to each of the actors in this value chain. So we, we believe that these things are really important. And, and when you really look at what I talked about, I mean, the, the, the key success comes from openness and clear problem statement to solve. And, and they, this should also be clearly proven in proof of concept. It should be possible to take to market in a smooth way. It should be, I mean, and, the, and that also require the right infrastructure that is defined and deployed. And, and um, you know, it's important that these alliances also publish their findings as early as possible and also work with other alliances to, to get, to get cross-pollination. It, it is possibly more effective to have more and smaller organizations to, to, to work on a specific problem than maybe bigger organizations working with the more, you know, wide uh, problem domains, say. But it, of course, need to come to... To, to a common solution in the end. Uh, one example there is, uh, you know, what we have done uh, in ACC is that we have proof of concept working. Uh, an example is with Ericsson, Toyota and Vodafone. And we're doing things with advanced connectivity and edge compute, even if Vodafone is not part of the, of the community for ACC, but they have found the, the or used the technical reports and use them because there are interesting findings there to, to be learned from. So, so that is what we really see as a value, you know, publish this. It's not really an internal thing. It has to be public. Um, if we look at a um, really important thing is that, you know, we have to do things on, um, you know, in general, it, it has to be proposed, solution proposal must be provider agnostic. It has to be open for anyone to implement. Reference architecture must be open and published in. in it must be, because otherwise it don't get the right scale and, and reach. And we, if we look a little bit more than at, you know, the, the, the whole thing around building, uh, um, building um, global open, B2B platform. So, I mean, one typical problem is when we look at the ecosystem situation discussed before, mostly of these ecosystems are global. Europe is part of the global ecosystem. And the, the maybe the most important thing in step one is to build out the infrastructure for connectivity and cloud. And, and five years ago, the example, considering the size of Europe, of course, compared to other markets. Uh, I mean, we have to be consistent and open within Europe. I mean, there are good things happening like removal of roaming fees, common roads for data sovereignty, privacy, et cetera, really good. Uh, regulations need to promote openness and collaboration within Europe and other markets as well. I mean, it's important that regulations do not block innovation and infrastructure build out that because that will heavily impact the evolution. So I think the last thing I want to say is that Europe, we have a very strong industrial ecosystem in various segments. I mean, and there should really be a, both possible to define the problem domains that we have from industry perspective and should be very much be possible to get the, together and line on solutions. These cannot be Europe specific, but, but it can and should, I think, be driven from an European industry actor point of view. And this could be done either by specific association created and driven in, uh, by Europe, but maybe more important that European companies join global moments and add their views and requirements so that they're a part of the evolution. And um, looking at the cloud providers, as we have discussed heavily, I mean, yes, there are important infrastructure providers to form this next generation uh, digital and mobile system, but really they are not necessarily setting the agenda because they don't own the requirements and they don't own the, the industry business as such. So this is something super important, I think, for us to consider. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Christo. No, this is uh, again adding to the, well, if, if not the, the solution space, then at least the complexity of this, <clears throat> because of course the whole regulation is something uh, which is, is at the center of what the Commission, of course, is reflecting on in the policies and in the work programs where to support. 
and we talked about so the rolling plan for standards so where are the gaps uh, that could be filled but also um what what is there to to actually then support uh, maybe that the market doesn't just fix by itself so openness okay we know as a principle but we also know it tends to favor the uh, well certain dynamics in the market right so so the regulation versus innovation is an interesting uh, uh well uh, focus area in in all of this Thanks a lot uh, for your perspective. We move now to NXP and, and Gerardo. Um, please take the floor and, and share your, your view. Uh, and I will say again, in five to eight minutes, I hope we can yeah, have yeah. a little bit of discussion in the end, but many of you touched upon you know, the, the key things here. So Gerardo, welcome. Yes, thank you very much. Um... Okay, I don't know how to get rid of this one. We see your slides and we yeah. hear you, so please. Okay, so you're fine. Okay, so I take it, uh, thanks for the overviews of the other speakers, and I take it all the way to, which in my terminology is also the edge, the end device that the end user is using. So you could call it the car, you could call it your smartwatch, you could call it your Fitbit, you could call it your smart lighting in the, in the home. Um, and I take an enabling technology perspective and indicate a little bit what are important aspects. Uh, so basically, the world that we envisage, it, it's going to be smarter. It's going to be anticipating what you want to provide really ease of use and a value-added experience. And to do that, it, it must be a seamless part of a bigger whole. It doesn't mean it's all the time per se connected, uh, which is where in the previous speakers we had the the cloud perspective, and let's say the mobile edge computing perspective, the data perspective that connects, uh, connects it all. But in the end, it ends up in the end inferencing device. And it's not per se so that that needs real time uh, uh, connectivity uh, all the time. Um, and this smarter, these smarter anticipatory, extremely easy to use devices they will use artificial intelligence in a big way. I think it will be part of the smartness in every, essentially in every device. And there are issues associated with developing such uh, devices. Uh, but first, let me make the point that these inference nodes, really they drive the volume in the next computing wave. As you can see here, we have over the years, the mainframes, mini computers, uh, personal computing, mobile computing, driving volume. And now it becomes these small devices that everybody has in his, in his home. Uh, and these are very smart devices because they will have intrinsically sensing and then a compute capability with smartness, uh, let's say from artificial intelligence and also model-based uh, to provide the, the, the use experience. And they have in intra-device connectivity and occasional or all, always on connectivity to the outside world. Uh, the smartness comes from basically big data that has been collected and you have learned out of these big data through machine learning and AI, what are uh, uh, the anticipated or needed functionalities and algorithms for that. And those algorithms you really embed in the IoT inferencing device, which I call edge processing here, but it's, it's edge processing in the end device. And to underpin this, this growth, you see here a couple of these, of the numbers of devices, and they, they differ between, you know, simple tagging devices, but in huge volume, 60 billion units per year or so, to, you know, ultimate edge device, like such a highly automated driving vehicle, which contains lots of sensors, lots of semiconductor value, and that's kind of a very smart edge device, if you wish. So here are the numbers that underpin this growth. Uh, and what you already see from these edge devices, uh, these different types of edge devices, they are very, there is a huge variety. So in the cloud, you could say computing wise, um, um, it's about lots of processing power, lots of memory, um, and indeed the data uh, that, that feed those, but the devices have very many different um, flavors and how you see, perceive them as a user. And they have other types of requirements in addition. 
They may have the need for ultra low power. They may have the need to be really real time. They may have the need to be really functionally safe so that there are no accidents in your industrial environment or in your automotive environment. Uh, and because there are so many, there are many attack surfaces. So the system security is, 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 is very important. So there are billions of these edge devices. And all of them have lots of technology, each of them inside it. So that's a lot of multiple concurrent requirements that you need to uh, find a solution for. And now what is added to the mix is that there are neural networks that are trained in these big clouds and they need to be brought towards the edge device, these little edge devices with various sizes and compute capabilities. So there are translation steps from what you do as big training in the cloud to the small devices that you use every day. And there are very many frameworks, very many different types of data and contexts of data. And there are also many incompatibilities that are arising from that. And now the challenge is that uh, all of this has to be, uh, let's say, designed and optimized concurrently for the variety of inferencing edge devices. And that's quite a different, let's say, skill set than devising the cloud uh, compute environment. And that's where the opportunity for Europe is in our uh, point of view. The huge variety of devices, multiple concurrent uh, requirements that need to be solved at the same time. And what is now added to the mix is a whole new data science that gets added and you need to mix in as well. So uh, the advantages to bringing intelligence to the cloud is that, you know, uh, sorry, to, to the edge device is that you can enable really real-time analytics and activation, and you are not per se hampered by the very fast uh, networks or back office latencies. Uh, you can reduce the data center traffic uh, that leads to, uh, to less cost. It's also more green. And of course, uh, you can in increase the privacy because only conclusions uh, are sent uh, centrally uh, and you are resilient against, uh, because you are, can be offline more, you have a smaller attack surface so your security can, can increase. And in addition, in addition, with the neural networks running on the inferencing devices, basically what is happening is that uh, when a user is acting in a certain way and the neural network on the device will thinking in a different way, this deviation between the intelligence that you put in beforehand and what the actual user is doing, that difference between it is a form of labeling and you could use that to make your devices smarter. But it doesn't mean that you need to train everything in the cloud a priori. The user uh, becomes the labeler and becomes the means to refine uh, basically the algorithms. So the whole world becomes a living lab, if you wish, uh, in this new uh, paradigm. Um, so basically the summary sheet is there is an enormous variety now in the, in the edge nodes, and that is a huge opportunity. There is therefore a need for skill because you add a new, whole new technology field uh, to, to the mix, but you need access to data, uh, basically, per vertical industry to be able to uh, deduce from the application, application usage, the, the smart models and the neural networks and the system behavior in order to put that intelligence in the inferencing device. Um, so you need to apply existing technologies to go towards low power, real time, safety, security, and you need to combine it with an additional investment in learning about AI and implementing that. And to do that, you need to select basically the, the winning roadmaps. And the implication currently is that there is a revirtualization taking place where really mega players having access to lots of uh, data they drive the cloud AI enabled solutions, they gather the data insights, and they can drive a lot of the inferencing solutions in the market because of this huge know-how they have. However, you could say there is a way to change the playing field, and that is that uh, um, by basically uh, uh, a number of measures, 
But the solution on the one hand is that you go for this market of embedded devices that are running in, in the millions where you provide scalable solutions so you can reuse really the, uh, the investment you put in it across a wide variety of uh, solutions. Um, the low power, the safety, security and real-time competences are part of the scalable solution. And then you enable optimization towards this embedded edge where these requirements you take into account, not only the parameters from the data that are used, uh, that are supplied centrally, but also the parameters of your devices, which is your, um, basically the know-how of the embedded devices you bring into the mix. And that can be your differentiator. To make this work, you need to have both a vertical orientation. So, yeah, Gerardo, so I'm sorry, just, I hope we're wrapping results. up because we're running towards the end of the hour. So I want yeah, to so a, this is my I last, uh, this is my last uh, sheet indeed. Ah, so, so you want to, to, to wrap it? This is, my, this is my wrap-up sheet. So basically, my, my state is that by making use of all the embedded know-how for the inferencing nodes and combining that with the new uh, aspects of AI, that's how you can win in the market. Uh, it's not only AI what matters and, uh, and the very important aspect of data, of course, but you need to combine it with the intrinsic characteristics of your inferencing nodes. And that provides a, uh, basically a differentiator how Europe can win. Thanks for this very, very inspiring uh, conclusion, if, if you will. And again, uh, so yesterday we had the AI uh, communication, which is a legislative train. I think it's very relevant to this, you know, understanding what are the regulatory boundaries <clears throat> of this living lab, as, as you uh, phrase it, uh, but also, you know, what are the technology, the business, the societal, the environmental aspect of this? <clears throat> a final word from each of our panelists, I think would be good. Thank you, Gerardo Rod. Hubert, so uh, we have of course reflected on the ecosystems, the associations, the partnerships and the platforms that are made. Some final words to share with the colleagues. Yeah, two, two final words, Martin. One, I have seen in every of the presentation, the importance and non-functional requirements in the design of edge cloud. Among the constraints, there is a low consumer consumption of uh, energy, which was mentioned in the last uh, presentation. So that is uh, probably my first uh, comment. The second comment, which is absolutely key, there is no point having edge cloud if it is not to answer a need from the industry. And the need from the industry is not initially for edge cloud, it is for data sharing at various level. And if we do not get the consensus within data spaces about the data they want to share, you will not have the support for what will become a huge investment in each of the industry we are talking about. Thanks, Hubert. Very, very inspiring. And we are seeing this popping us up also in different places. So focus on data is the, the clear message uh, from many sides. Thank, thanks a lot. Um, Dario, from, from your uh, quickly uh, reflection. Sure, from my point of view, I think uh, I totally agree. I will add a, lot, a couple of uh, words as well from my side on Edge Cloud. Of course, importance of the standardization is for for enabling interoperability. We are talking about uh, edge computing. So decentralization means, of course, having uh, multiple systems. In this heterogeneity, uh, uh, interoperability is a key. Otherwise, uh, it's not uh, possible to, to, to reach uh, uh, the goals of, of the market. And then uh, uh, standard is a, uh, is a key for, for that interoperability. This is the only, the only um, adding point that we would like to Thanks a lot for that for that statement. And I, I guess standards embedded in a community with needs, right? So back yeah. to the point from Uber, it must be needs driven. Um, so Krista, from your side, final final reflection. Yes, to, uh, backing Hubert's statement there that uh, you know the, the the real need doesn't come from from a fact that you need a specific cloud uh, solution. It comes from a from a from an industry problem, and then there are, are ways to solve that, where edge compute is a, is a great example of both for the data sharing, as, as, as mentioned, but also the fact to, to actually 
filter and steer what the type of data you actually move to the cloud, uh, that, that is a key one. And, and to repeat myself again, I think alliances need to be global and, and Europe need to tap into these and, and also form them and, and help these alliances to, 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 to work on the right uh, uh, requirements also. Thanks a lot. Uh, so uh, again, so we have this paradox even. So we need the infrastructure to solve real problems, but nobody wants the infrastructure as such. We, we need the problem solved. So it's it's a chicken and egg in, in some cases. So we cannot just be driven by isolated uh, local business cases. Thank, thanks a lot. Gerardo, final final words. We just heard you, but just- Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank reflection. you very much. So clearly we are on the cusp that um, uh, you need a, um, both a vertical approach to uh, to address market segments as a horizontal approach about, uh, that relates to data sharing and interoperability so that the intelligence can be created in the uh, basically in the the added value of the of the of the algorithms that then get inserted into the final products that people use to, to derive added value from so basically uh, it becomes one world from end device but you need the cloud where there is interoperability and a vertical specialization to really find out user needs. Thanks. And of course, this also reflects with what we started with. So the interoperability framework in Europe is actually T-shaped when you go to the local level, the, the EIF that's that's being updated and the policies. Thanks a lot. Um, a virtual hand to our panelists.